Welcome everyone to episode 109 of the New Gen Mindset Podcast. I'm Dan Kozell here with Nick Tartaglia. Um, I think it's spring now. Yeah, that's what we thought. But uh, uh-huh. like the world took a little surprise turn. We got snow again. So, well, did it actually kind of half melted so yeah so 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 we're kind of entering this transition period q2 basically started for all you uh economic people out there um but uh we've had a lot of intel sort of come in i've been deep down sort of not necessarily a rabbit hole but just like trying to figure out what's ultimately going on in the world um this is kind of an emergency type of podcast we'll call it just because you and I really believe that there's escalation happening to another level. And quite frankly, I personally, and I don't know if you agree with this, but I personally, and, and we're not trying to fear monger anybody here mm-hmm. at all, but it's just so you're aware of what's going on. But I, I, I think, I think we're already in world war three. Well, I mean, I don't disagree because I mean, we can go some play semantics and argue what's the word, but to the extent of how things are playing out internationally outside of the, what well, outside of North America specifically, I mean, God damn it does seem like things are basically in that position because you even have now France and some EU countries that really want to go and participate in Ukraine. And now you have Blinken who declared an emergency type of like, oh, no, Ukraine is officially going to become part of NATO, which is just opening the floodgates to exactly what Russia and Putin did not want. Then Israel and uh, Iran, that there's escalation there. There's escalation in the Philippines. So like... <clears throat> I it, I mean it's semantics, but it's like, is it hard to? Is it? Can you truly argue? No, we're not there. I don't think so. Um, there was an interesting documentary that I or docu series that I watched on Netflix during the Easter break. Um, I yeah. highly recommend everybody who's listening go watch that. Uh, it's nine episodes, about an hour and a half each, so it's pretty lengthy. Um, but what it does is it explains exactly sort of the historical facts or the historical events that happened that really <laughs> led to where we're at right now. Um, and essentially we're at a point, Nick, where I think um, people just got to really understand, okay, this is going to have massive economic impacts and, you know, you want to protect yourself in the, this environment. So before we go global, let's talk about what's going on domestically, because I think that's also really important is Canada is really, Canadians are struggling. Canadians are really starting to struggle. Um, there's a huge, there's a huge, movement too. <laughs> there's a huge sort of discrepancy right now between what's being reported on the mainstream versus what's actual reality. Um, and it's really been a result of the current leadership's lack of understanding of fiscal and monetary policy. Um, and I think you just really have to go back to what happened when COVID started because they just felt that, oh, it'd be okay. We just hand out a bunch of handouts, you know, serve the economy and serve is like a top priority. Like, let's just give out free money to everybody. You and no I were consequences, sound- you know, no consequences. You, you, you and I were really sounding the alarm on the fact that this is extremely inflationary and dangerous. Um, and it's going to it's going to play out over the next couple of years. And here we are three, three to four years later, and unemployment is at six point one percent. You have people working three two, maybe four jobs just to get by. We're seeing videos of like everyday Canadians who have families saying they can't even take it anymore. Mm-hmm. Pensioners going back to work, you know, people going to get a second, third job. Uh, these are all things you have to take into account when you need this number. And then something we didn't even you didn't mention is. How much, what percentage of this labor strength is coming from just public sector, government creating these jobs, which does it by taking money from the public sector, from the private sector, and then paying administrative people, which is not really a productive component of the market. Yeah. And I was reading a a report yesterday, and I'm not afraid to say this now, but I read through it and it omitted pretty much all of this. It just kept touting, oh, we have a strong economy. We have strong jobs numbers. Well, not really. Like 6.1% is pretty high. And they completely omitted the fact that one inflation is a lot higher than what it what it, what's actually being reported. That's the first right. thing. The second thing is they're saying that oh everybody can pretty much afford a home. That's not true. Everyone's turning. We we we've become a renting economy really. Um, and I can you can actually start feeling this in locally. I was talking to a few real estate people uh, the last two days, and particularly in Montreal, I'm not going to name anybody, but 
there's a few developers that are on the verge potentially of bankruptcy. And the reason for that is because everybody was operating under the assumption that rates were just going to get lowered at some point. Right. So I don't know what, what, what you're hearing on the street with regards to that, but I, I just, it, it doesn't surprise me to say the least that this is happening. We've been screaming for the last three years that, you know, this is not a good thing. Well, I mean, and, and, it, it was usually misinformation from the, uh, media standpoint so <laughs> and and there's 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 really this misleading metric with gdp right where it's like oh it's strong economic growth the, the the canadian economy is growing well no it's actually declined in the last two quarters so where where do we go from here man like it, it's 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 just we're at an inflection point where i think a lot of people are starting to realize that their voting decisions for the last like four even 10 years have massive consequences and now we have a potential election or actually it's coming up 2025 mm -hmm. canadians are going to go to the polls and decide what they want to do although i personally just feel like it's already been decided and i might sound like a crazy person i don't know what you think about that at this point i don't trust any political system so if trudeau ends up the winner canada's absolutely totally fucked up so that's not a good one so let's hope I mean, it's not usually a word I like to use, but in this case, goddamn, let's hope because if, if voting seems to be a useless game, you're just picking a different master every time, or which one is the worst case scenario, and uh, Canada is definitely going through a, all kinds of crisis, or a cultural crisis, an identity crisis. Doesn't know what the hell's going on. Immigrants are like, well, I can't even find a job here. Things are too expensive. I'm better off just going back home. So people want to go back home, and they're like, fuck Canada. There's a productivity crisis that. Uh, the one of the main financial institutes in Canada has apparently declared. And in back to the point of the real estate thing is too is like, well, hold on, hold on. What, what do you mean? Which financial institution? Uh, the about? superintendent finance. I wrote it in the macro report. I forget exactly. It's a long name. The super, uh, the superintendent financial institution of Canada. I think is the total name. So they declared a uh, an emergency in the productivity of Canada, which you know that. <laughs> Like that, when you have a stagnating productivity, it falls into the whole stagflation thesis because you're going to have the government that's going to keep trying to fight this whole productivity crisis by trying to stimulate the economy, but the economy is going sideways while this spending is going up. So this is where you get the stagflation of this, this sideways movement, which falls into this thing where, where, which is something you definitely believe in, which I agree with in at least absolutely in the short to near term is there's no rate cuts coming. Because they can't, they can't at least cut. at least this year, I think there's correct. No you know, like yeah. uh, for the good short for foreseeable future, based on current metrics, they don't have validation to want to start cutting because they're backwards looking. So as the input data comes in, which is a lagging factor, they can, they're not going to be like, well, maybe things will, and then we'll start when the data is not there yet. So the data needs to start rolling in, which is a lagging effect. So you know, like. Uh, so I agree with you. It could be end year, early next year, more like that. It's always lagging. It's got the same thing like they decided to fight inflation. It took time before they said inflation is temporary, inflation is temporary. And then they said, okay, no, now we need to start raising rates. Well, there, there was that lagging and that slow effect. And I think that'll be the exact same thing when it comes to the rates, if there's rate cuts again. Yeah. Um, kind of want to go back just briefly on the Canadian real estate stuff. Like for the last 40 oh, years, yeah. a lot of the wealth that was created was Two through thirds. Home. Correct. Was, so two thirds through, RBC. So, yeah. Was 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 through home ownership, right? So what does that tell you? And now you've got, I mean, our generation, we're getting priced out. Nobody can afford to buy a home. And I heard as well through multiple agents that people our age are going to their parents for a down payment on a property. Just think about that for a second. We're supposed to be a thriving nation. We're the beacon of democracy, whatever the hell that actually means. Right. We're supposed to be like at the top of what we're doing. And really what's happening now is I think the, the gap between the middle class and sort of that upper echelon is just it's it's going like this. And that's not only happening here, that's happening in the US too, right All, now, yeah, aggressively. Yeah, exactly. So All so the Western nations are redeemed, you know, more on the free market side and that were deemed, you know, prosperous middle class societies. You because typically what you get is in a freer market or in a prosperous economy, you have more of a diamond shaped. If you were to visualize the kind of socioeconomic classes, a few at the bottom, they move towards the middle where the majority is, 
and it's more spread out. And then you got to funnel it back to the top where there's a little bit at the top. So you get this diamond shape. We're regressing. We're getting more of this wealth disparity, pushing more of the middle class towards the bottom where majority starting to become. And you're getting more of a pyramid structure, which is where you get in centralized societies and in all sorts of bad economies throughout history. You always have this pyramid structure. And this is kind of where we're falling into again. And, and we're getting taxed to death. <laughs> um carbon tax was just increased absolutely fortunately correct. fortunately i mean there's always a trade-off in quebec we don't have the carbon tax here no, we How, as, it's less we have it, it it's just a cheaper one it's yeah. it's it's the lowest i think out of all yeah, of them but we correct. we get we we get annihilated on taxes because there's a double taxation here with with revenue quebec correct exactly exactly it's that and with the hydro thing so i think it so it's about i think it's like 60 percent of the total federal carbon tax, Quebec pays only, we pay only 60% of it. So we still pay it. It's just not to the same extent, but it's still bullshit regardless. So, right. you know, and then back to the real estate thing again, is you have to think about this factor, right? It's okay. We want, do we, the government, like Janet Yellen is a perfect example. You know, when we're tied to basically kind of more of a central thinking is Janet Yellen said, we don't need prices to come back down because we have wage growth. She's directly admitting that they don't want deflation. Deflation is what's needed if we want prices to come down. And in Canada, it, Let's say 65, 70% of the entire wealth effect is really coming from the housing market. The last thing that the government wants, that the central bankers want, is to have deflation because that whole wealth effect is decimated. People's spending would fall. People will start feeling poor, and that will trickle deeply into the economy. So that perception game they love to play, the real estate market is very important for them to play that game in Canada since it makes up a majority of the wealth and therefore makes a majority of the wealth effect to drive people to spend. So this is something that we have to pay attention to, especially in trying to establish, do we do they want deflation? Do they want inflation? And how are they going to be playing that game? And this is where the rates kind of come into play in the scenario. Yeah. And for those of you listening, the key metric that I always look at, particularly in Canada, to see what, what rates are going to look like within a three to six month period, just look at the three-year uh, Canadian bond because that'll tell you. And the last time I checked, it was at 5%. So that's actually higher than what the rate is right now. Something's gonna crack here. I don't know what it is, um, but you're you're seeing a massive shift now. From a socioeconomic standpoint in Canada, I mean, we've had a massive shift here in the last ten years, mm -hmm. uh, and it's provided us with some very unintended consequences where people are actually forgetting to denounce what it means to be a Canadian. I find, mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, if you're listening to this and you think, oh well, Nick and Dan are extremists or they hate people in society. No, that's not true. But when you let people into our country that hate Canada, that hate the West, what do yeah. you expect the consequences to ultimately be? And that's why I'm really concerned about what's happening, particularly in Ontario and Toronto. Yeah, this the crisis, the violence crisis. The, there. the, there's, there's a massive surge in crime right now. There is a liberal NDP mayor of Toronto who is proposing to tax you when rain starts falling. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we've reached peak lunacy. So Toronto, if you're listening, like great city. I mean, I hate your hockey team, but like get your shit together because this is absurd. It's not Toronto is not what it used to be. And unfortunately, that's I, I hate to say this. If this continues, this could potentially trickle into Montreal. This could tr trickle into the other major cities. We haven't seen that. It's not as aggressive yet as it is in the united states and we'll get to that in a second but toronto is really what's happening in toronto right now is a sneak peek of what could potentially happen if we don't have a change in leadership or change in policy so i'll leave it and at culture that. and culture absolutely uh, i'll i'll leave it at that though because we've got we've got some other stuff we want to talk about yeah. right um the u.s very uh very problematic jobs numbers. Um, I mean, people are going to say, well, what do you mean? They just added 330 or 303,000 jobs. Well, if you dig deeper, if you really take a look at what the jobs numbers is, is, is encompassing now, you have to go back to what happened when Biden got elected. What was the first thing he did as soon as he, he became president there? He enacted some executive order. What did he do? Do you remember? Well, there was the border thing. Exactly. With the immigrants. Oh, that's okay, okay. So he immediately repealed, immediately repealed Trump's immigration policy. And this is not political. This is just observational. I want everybody to, who's listening to really understand what's happening. They have let in about four and a half million illegal undocumented immigrants into the United States through the southern border. What kind of consequences is that having? 
now there's reports now from. now there's now there's reports as well as evidence that this administration is legalizing these immigrants before they're into the country so that they could get flown to these major cities and start working <laughs> that is the jobs growth that's coming in <laughs> For cheap and you call labor. that strength. And people have to understand it. It's more of a masquerade because all it is is it's being used as a way to masquerade the fundamental problem in the labor and marketplace, which has been years of accumulation, especially with what they did during COVID and especially the damage to the, they did to the productivity market. Like a perfect example is, you know, uh, uh, Canada, we, like I said, declared the, the emergency, the productivity emergency at, or across North America. You're seeing. Uh, school unattendance at levels they've never seen. And this is this is just little variabilities that you can see scattered across the marketplace of productivity of people more focused on politics and unions and, and organizing themselves and actually being a productive worker. They want to work at home. They don't want to work in person. You name it. And all these things, these problems that you're seeing in the marketplace from local or people that actually live within the West typically, it, it's just being masqueraded by allowing these external people to come in and fill up those holes but all these people that don't have jobs or seeking jobs or they're unproductive they become a, an expanding burden to the overall economy and as that problem continues to expand you're just looking at these, this growing this growing virus or this growing cancer that internalized in the labor market is just is just rippling out and if that effect continues it just ripples out to the entire labor market especially in the ones that are more on the socialist or or issue side like i feel like florida might not necessarily overall be have that kind of problem certain states but the ones that are really more obsessed with unions and liberal uh, the the new age liberalism socialism yeah, like, like they new, seem to new new, new york, new york L L correct. illinois michigan uh la chicago and like all all these sort of we'll call them blue states red states florida's got its own problems right now correct. um they're, they're dealing with the massive inflow of people coming in from Haiti. Sort of, yeah, exactly. Haiti but too. they're 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 being undermined by the administration too. Like this is this is not like conspiracy, by the way. No. I just want everybody to understand. <laughs> this just is not at the forefront of media. <laughs> it, it, because they don't want people talking about it. And that's totally fun. I just want to pull up a quick chart here before we continue because oh. we're talking on jobs numbers. But this is the United States right now. Full okay. Time, part time, yeah, exactly. So this is very concerning to me. When I'm looking at this data and I'm saying, okay, you've added 303,000 new jobs, you've actually lost, right, just under 6,000 6, 6, new full-time employees. People are working two to three jobs Correct. just to get by. That's, that's the point is that number doesn't actually work. Like how, what, per, what percentage of that is people getting a second or third job? It doesn't tell you. So you you have double and triple counting of the same person and you call that strength. Is me having to labor more because of the fact that the government is causing regression in the economy strength from an individual standpoint? Of course not. But it's strength from a government standpoint, from this Keynesian standpoint. Of course it's strength because that's all they care about. It's like just be a good little worker. Just work, 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 work. Keep fueling what we need to do. As an external conflict keeps growing, that burden on us as individuals just keeps to growing. So, so this begs the question now, it's like, what's ultimately the end goal here? And I keep, ask, I, I, I keep asking myself this question because it's like, okay, people are in the U S are clearly fed up with, I mean, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of like some, people, so we'll say some, we'll say some, but from, from talking to people who live there, they're all really on the same page here. They're fed up with what's happened the last three years. It is an election year. Trump has been smeared all over the media. They've tried to arrest him. They tried to jail him. Last night, he raised $50 million for his campaign. And these are people that previously, there were some people apparently that did not vote for Trump in 2020 that are all coming to the table now because they're starting to realize, holy crap, this administration does not care about the American worker. They don't care about the American people. They don't care about their own civilians. They would rather import an entire group of, you know, violent, pretty much not, you know, these are not good people. Well, it's just a, it's just an open gate. It's just a free for all. I'm not There's saying no all of them. I'm not saying all of them, but you just have to draw the correlations. Why is crime going up in all mm -hmm. these major cities? 
right? Like just connect the dots. Regression, but it, but again, granted, I will say that a lot of the crime is not necessarily, it depends on where we look in the States, but not all the data indicates that it's entirely uh, externally driven by illegal immigration. There are also variabilities, like for example, where you're just having total absolute uh, regression in cultures where there's just typically more poor people. So a lot of those poor people in that are American in those areas are just regressing to using more crime and violence. Like you get these gang mobs of uh, in Chicago or in San Francisco that are not necessarily tied to illegals, but they're just massive gangs of people coming in and attacking stores. Now you are seeing the same behavior from illegal immigrants. Absolutely. It's just, it's not necessarily a scattered across illegals. It's both illegals and a regression in culture in America, where now you're seeing even like poor communities or people that just don't seem any ability to find a job or whatever, being part of gangs that are just taking care of cleaning up. Also granted the laws don't care. Like you, you can't, there's no, you, you cops are not going to prioritize theft. They're not going to go after them. Stores just, you just have to let them do what they want. So it, it's becoming easy to rob. Like we saw once on news where the guy was saying, I go to, I go to San Francisco or California to rob. And then I go to, and then I go back to Florida to spend my money. <laughs> you know, so it, that's a huge indication of it. It's just a scattered overall problem. And then when people want to get to the immigration again, me and Dan, we've spoken about this already on another podcast, but the issue is the fact that we don't have I'm not against immigration. By Crazy, way. Exactly. This so, is what I'm cleaning up. So yeah. we're not, against, it's not that we're against immigration. It's the, it's the system in which we've uh, developed in which we have immigration. When you have a welfare system and you have immigration, it's a whole other game because now you're just bringing anybody to take advantage of a system where we have to burn the cost of them coming here. Typically in history, America and Canada, a lot of the immigration was free for all. There was no necessity to sign up, but that's because you didn't have a system that took care of people when they came here. So people that came here wanted to be productive, wanted to be a, become a part of the culture, wanted to work and make something of themselves to take care of their family in a new place that had a new opportunity that was away from the crime and the tyranny and the bad government that they lived in. But now we're creating the same environment that people typically escape from. So now we're part of that game. Yeah. And I think you brought up something really interesting, which was laws. Um, there are, there's something called squatting or squatting that's happening in the United States, which is essentially if your house is unattended, and this is happening in New York aggressively. This is happening in Illinois. This is happening in Pennsylvania Calif and California. Not not so much in California, but definitely no. <laughs> in New York right now, where if your house is unattended and there's an illegal that comes in, an illegal alien, and they can take your house and you come back to your house, the homeowners are getting arrested for trying to kick them out. They have manufactured and integrated these laws that prevent the individual who owns the property to essentially not be able to kick out people who have just literally stolen their land or stolen Think about how fundamental that is because property rights is a foundation of American of American philosophy. And that this whole dynamic of squatter rights is completely destroying that because now you no longer have access to your property that you own because the state has deemed that others who enter it may claim it as theirs. You're now regressing us to these primal games where bah, first come, first curve, or I steal you, you steal from me now, instead of just, no, this is my property, get out, or else there's a problem. That's how normal, that's how a civilized society functions by respecting each other's property. We're allowing complete regression in the scenario. And then there's that TikTok guy, right? So Yeah, which which went viral, who literally said, Here, if you're from Venezuela, it was this Venezuelan guy who came in and said, We found houses, come, we can occupy them. I mean, this is in a way, this is like Marxist regression. I don't want to say it's like coming from the leader himself. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this is what Stalin did when World War II ended, is he he basically stole everyone's property and made it part of the state. This in a way is that it's it's trending down that direction. And they always say when you when 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 you give an inch they take a right. mile. Take like, a finger, give a finger or take a hand. It, exactly. So the, it's it's crazy. So I want I'll go back to Florida. If you do that in Florida, like you're yeah, going to prison, you just they'll deport it. you. Correct. The the homeowners are allowed to shoot you if you do, if you want to play that game.
Yeah. <laughs> they, they've given so, permission to homeowners. Th they're, it, they're really not fucking around. No, anymore. it's because you're not empowering the individual who are your citizens. You're empowering criminality. And you're saying, well, the criminals can do whatever they want. And the legal law abiding citizens, well, if you do something wrong, you're the one who's going to get in trouble. What kind of game, what kind of culture do you want to do you want to fuel with this kind of logic? It's delusion. Absolute madness. I, I know we're in an election season in the U.S., um, and I was looking at recent poll numbers, and again, Florida has turned fully Republican. And Florida, in previous elections, was always a swing state. It's not anymore. It's like hardcore, like, you come here, there's laws you got to abide by. That's why everyone's moving there, because it's, it's, a, it's a thriving economy. I mean, you even have Jeff Bezos, who's buying up properties left, right, and center, because he understands the tax implications. Like, people understand what's going on, um, and I, I really feel terrible for people that are in New York, Chicago, um, all these Cali, blue states, California. California. I mean, Oakland is falling apart. Oakland yeah. got rid of their sports teams, man. That is a huge thriving economic vehicle that nobody really talks about because they've all moved to Vegas. Vegas is thriving, right? So again, all these things that they're coming out, they're saying job numbers are strong. The economy is good. It's like, yeah, there's the wealth effect, the inflationary effect. But then you go back and you just say, well, you got to ask a very simple question. And this goes for Canadians and Americans, mm -hmm. too. Are you better off than you were four or five years ago? Very simple question. If you can answer that, you can make a decision on where we're going. But I just think the social decay in the West right Correct. now is so visible. It's extremely concerning and it, it needs to change before it, before it's Correct. too late. I personally think it's too late right now. Uh, but anyway. No, but I want people to understand that because the social decay is, I think, the most imp it's the most indicative variable to understanding where the economy is going. You might not necessarily be able to precisely say, OK, I know exactly what's going to happen to the economy. What you can say is if an economy is the outcome or the byproduct of a society's collaborative effort between individuals, if that decay expands and grows at an exponential rate, the economy will eventually follow that truth it's you can't have a separation the only way you can fall in that game of seeing a separation where you have social decay but you have a strong economy is by using these game metrics that the government uses that's the only way they can masquerade it but fundamentally we're not solving any problems and we're having this regressive this hardcore social decay and that will come by kicking us in the fucking balls in this economy that's for sure yeah. So again, my if, if you're listening to this, this is not to fear monger anybody, but this is reality. Um, I we I have think to accept the, risk. The, yeah. the, the, there's a big risk right now that's happening. So how do we kind of protect ourselves from it? We'll get to that towards the end of this uh, discussion. But um, let's keep moving forward as to what's happening globally, because I think this is where perhaps the U.S. ultimately is manipulating jobs data to keep funding their operations globally. And it's no surprise at this point. Really, in my mind, Nick, this whole thing started when Biden completely butchered the Afghanistan withdrawal, because that showed to the world that the US is like decaying to an alarming degree. So when that happened, I think China looked at that. They're like, OK, we can start planning military operations to take over potentially Taiwan. We'll see. China has been very quiet. We'll talk about that soon. Yeah, exactly. Um, Iran, mm -hmm. the proxies, um, they've been obviously taking advantage of what's happening. And there's new details that have emerged about what happened in Israel, about how Iran was ultimately behind this. Um, and we'll get to that. And then the last thing is, I think NATO, Ukraine and Russia, you know, escalation there. That is the escalation of historical events that have happened over the last 50 years, if not more, maybe even 70 years, I would say. Um, so where do you want to start? Because there's a lot to talk about. And I said this earlier, Nick, um, we're, we're already in world war three. You could feel it. Um, ironically, I think Canada is probably the safest place to be. If you mm -hmm. can find a country house in the woods somewhere while this stuff starts ex escalating, you're probably in good hands. But to me, what's telling me that this is escalating is look at how, look at gold. I mean, we've been talking about this for three years, man. We're like, Hey, gold is probably on its way high for monetary and fiscal uh consequences right well and, but, and geopolitical consequences but it's i think never good reasons gold goes up for right and and i think in this time like this past week gold kept going even higher because of this escalation again a little bit of speculation in my mind but it's like like to your point it's like 
when gold goes up, it's not necessarily a good thing, but it's never a good, that's the whole point of gold is it's to, to hedge myself against bad things. When bad things start to happen, gold price starts to account for that. And that's when gold starts to do well, because it's saying, damn, I need to protect myself against whatever bad's coming. That's the whole point of gold or else gold just stays flat typically. So gold is outperforming. It's because, well, central banks keep buying and because geopolitics is just the conflict around the world is just, getting, is just expanding and gold is just pricing that in. So let's talk about Ukraine and Russia because it's the first one. In it, I, it's really what started this whole thing. The last really the 2020s, right? COVID put a dent into that. They got Trump out of office. People saw how weak the world is under Biden, and they're taking oh, advantage absolutely. of the whole situation. You know, think of, here's another thing people also don't realize is Biden is never the one that goes and meets the world leaders. He always sends all these little incompetent little henchmen. Yeah, to do their bidding. And it's like, there's no, you have no concrete narrative or or position. You're just, you're scattering yourself with all these different people that it should be the main leader capable of speaking with other world leaders and not have all your little guys doing it. So again, we've talked about Ukraine extensively. We had our buddy Mike on, we talked about sort of the, the operation there. Like this conflict has been brewing since Putin got elected. And the NGOs that have infiltrated uh, Ukraine claiming that they're for democracy um, are responsible for this because you just have to go back a few decades to really understand what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed. Well, there were other Soviet republics that essentially wanted their own independence because of what happened in Berlin, right? The Berlin Wall fell down. That was when, okay, the Soviet power in that region after World War II, because Stalin wanted East Germany and Berlin, right? they realized all these other countries are like, we want our own independence. And that was like a snowballing effect. That that happened over the course of several years in the 90s, early 2000s, and then Putin becomes president. What's happened now is not surprising in, in my, my view, but we're getting to a point now where NATO is, mm -hmm. they're just like, it's they're scrambling at this point. And usually when, I forget what the saying is, but like when you lose your mind, you just res re resort to like doing stupid shit. Mm -hmm. I feel yeah, like you're like a cornered rat, like a cornered rat. I, I feel like NATO is just they 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 literally want a war to like escalate. And they're doing it on purpose because, quite frankly, and I'm not afraid to say this right now, I think a lot of people in NATO are actually getting massive kickbacks doing this. <laughs> I mean, so much money gets is getting funneled to all these people at the top. Spending is going up and everything. So all salaries go up and like it. And then you think about it this way too, right? They said it, well, they're using, uh, they're using uh, Russia. They're saying Russia wants to expand and control other European countries. They're using this fear mongering to justify further expansion of conflict. You know, we had France with Macron, who says that he wants to send French soldiers into uh, Ukraine. There's, I think there's the Netherlands as well. Um, and they're all using this fear tactic saying that that's because Russia wants to control. So it's like, and then we had Blinken the other day talking about how they want to fast track Ukraine's um, membership into NATO. <laughs> like this is the precisely what Putin and you and Russians don't want. And then you had the Moscow attack. It's like, are you asking for this conflict to just continue to get worse? And then you're going to drag in China and you're going to drag in other countries. China's been very quiet. We're going to get to that. I think they, they're they they're prepping because they, anyway, we'll talk about that in a second. But the, the thing I think everybody needs to understand right now is that that region in the world is going to be really the leading factor of why I think we're in World War III because it goes back to what Putin said earlier on. And again, you can't take everything he says at face value. Like anybody. Like anybody, because they're politicians. But, and he's, you know, I don't support him. Um, don't but, support it. We don't support any government, basically. But you have to understand that everything that's happened since 2022 is a result of the last 20 to 30 years, maybe even 50 years up until end of World War II, that's led us to this point, right? It always goes back to resources it always goes back to nuclear warheads which god forbid that ever happens you know i don't think it will because people are not these these people are not crazy but we'll talk i about, will say uh, i will say on nuclear the only one variable i personally really afraid of is if we keep pushing the buttons of north korea 
that's where I think there could be a nuclear problem because those guys are in a different world from the rest of the world. And that's the one country where my, like my senses are telling me just if we don't play that card, right. That's just my little one little thought on uh, nuclear when it comes to uh, North Korea. So again, let's with, with, with Ukraine, it's like the writing's been on the wall. That region is, unfortunately, it's in total conflict. But I really believe that if Putin wanted to end Ukraine, he could do it. Yes, he doesn't want to. That's the thing, you know. <laughs> he but just, yeah. He he's got he he could literally if he wanted to assault the entire country and destroy it and then rebuild it himself, he could do that. And that's what people fail to understand because somebody's net worth has gone up almost three times since he was prime minister or president of Ukraine. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um. Middle East, that is, I mean, growing as well. That 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 is escalating, uh, and I think it's escalating to a much higher degree than the the Ukraine stuff because what's essentially happened. Everyone's like, well, why did the, why did Israel actually go out and attack Syria? Well, it turns out they killed an Iranian leader that was responsible for planning the attacks of October seventh. Now, whether or not that's true is yet to be determined because there's all these reports that are out there, but everybody seems to be using some kind of justification to go after different parts of the world to further their agenda. Now, in Israel, there's right now, there's a bit of a civil conflict going on because prior to this war breaking out, you actually had civil conflict internally because of politics. And there was this huge divide that really just separated a lot of the people there in, in, in that country. Um, and then October 7th happened, and here we are. So now you've got the Suez Canal, uh, which is the most important uh, supply chain route for the shipping industry, just for anything economic. Uh, oil prices are going up. Yeah. Okay. Nobody saw that coming. I, I, I had some i have some oil exposure in my portfolio it's just i didn't expect it to go up this quickly i think wti right now is at 80 but we do know that the like the the the, the 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 big players in the oil industry around the world they one they know that oil is not going anywhere and two they know that like i feel like oil is a asset or commodity that they can utilize to kind of disrupt the west you you and can weaponize it Correct. You know, yeah. so I feel there's a part of that that's going on because they know what the West is doing to itself energy wise and, and with their oil that like, OK, if we play, if we do this, we can stir some some more economic conflict in the West. And it, that would be an easy thing for them to do. Yeah. And then you've got gold going up every day, uh, it <laughs> seems like, because that's a warning. But the escalation in that entire region, you've got, you know, Israeli embassies shutting down all over the Middle East. Um, you've got, uh, military operations that are happening more extensively. Iran is preparing to get involved. Correct. I would, I would argue, by the way, you brought up North Korea. I, I think why you said North Korea is because Iran and North Korea have an mm -hmm. alliance, but Iran has probably some nuclear warheads that were given to them. I don't know by who, um, I'm not going to speculate. I do have a few names in my head, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to say it. Um, I, I really believe that they, they could potentially do something pretty dangerous that could escalate it even more, uh, even more, uh, that could directly potentially implicate the United States. If the U S directly gets involved in this, in that region, we're going to have a serious problem. And that's kind of just, you just got to be aware of that because that's out there. Yeah. It's, I mean, I mean, over there we have America saying they're going to stay like, let's see, let's go from on the Asian side and the East with China, Philippines, Taiwan, you know, America says that they're staying out of it, but are they, they keep doing co like coll or collaborative joint military drills around the Philippines, around the Taiwan, they keep spending money to funnel money to Taiwan for military purposes all while saying that they're not going to get involved, all while saying that China doesn't want Taiwan to success from China and that it's actually part of China. So <clears throat> it's like something's happening there. And again, we're not talking about it, but it does appear to be something that is going on. And then back to North Korea. God damn, man, that, those people. It's like, it, it's because the issue with nuclear, nuclear is nobody's going to do it until one person does it. 
The moment one person starts that, it's a domino effect because now the, the doors are open. If I don't do it, it might happen to me. And this is where you're going back to Canada being safe. It's like, okay, if that game starts to go on, at least I know, or at least I think Canada wouldn't be one of the priorities because we're not really a threat on a global scale to anybody. We're also just heavily disrespected because <laughs> of a certain leader. But um, to to the to the uh, the China U.S. relations, I think I think she really can puppet Biden right now, and um, they're all rooting for him to get reelected because if they can it's if easy. they can <laughs> if they can get him back in for another four years, they can accelerate their agenda even more and put the world on a tipping scale to their to their to their liking. So. Um, Asia is interesting right now too. Um, Japan, they've been neutral obviously since World War II, but they just raised rates for the first time in thirty years. Out of years. negatives, out of seventeen years, first time in seventeen. First time, yeah, first time in seventeen years, um, and it's causing some discussion. So I don't know. Like history to me is always a it's a study of invasions. That's really what history ultimately is. It always has been. Um, geograph like the geographies change like that is what history is. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to that little country, considering they've had such a extensive history going back to World War II. Um, but yeah, I mean to your point, I mean one nuclear warhead goes off, like what is what's the first domino, domino that falls? Um, and so the way to hedge in this market is what we've been telling everybody and our subscribers. And we appreciate all of you is you, you need to have silver and gold in your portfolios at the, at this point in time, you really need to have some form of exposure. It doesn't have to be the miners, just get a regular index. Um, you know, maybe even get some physicals involved. I know a lot of people that are like Bitcoin heavy maximalists that have been buying a shitload of gold over the last two years and, and silver coins because people understand this is what happens. We're at a tipping point right now, and it always goes back to the resources that are available in the world, right? So, right. and don't forget, guys, more conflict exposes you to more threats, types, EMP waves, power grids going out, hacking, cybersecurity threats. What happens if I can't access my tele? I can't access the internet. What happens if I can't access my bank account? These are all things that we have to start taking into account. Because the world is not moving in a direction that says, don't think about these things. It's it's That's why gold is moving the way it is, because things are escalating on a global level. And if you want to play this game properly, and you want to be able to come out of it alive and not be scrambling and trying and panicking the moment shit does ha hit the fan, start really understanding what it is to diversify some tangible assets, some hard cash, some gold and silver, some Valorum Orum bills. You know, we just had the guy on. That's some awesome stuff. That I definitely think is. I can't. Some... I can't. I can't wait to touch one of those. Cause yeah, it, the... it it sucks that you can't buy it here yet in Canada. So if you're in the states, you can definitely buy it. Just go on their website. Really awesome bills. But these, like, it, it make yourself flexible. Don't have all your money in the bank because if the bank shuts down tomorrow, you're screwed. So you know, yeah, hedging is so important now, and this is why we talk about risk because if you don't understand your risk, you don't understand how you're hedging. So it, it's a necessary conversation. So uh, really to wrap it up, what I would say is, again, we're not here to fear monger anybody. We're here to really provide uh, a voice of sort of what we're seeing and just having discussions with people that have been doing this longer than we have, while also talking to people in parts of the world that are seeing these social effects. So just keep this in the back of your mind. If you're really not worried about, hap about what's happening, you're actually in a very good position. It's the people that are not thinking about these things right? It's not in the back of their mind. They think life is good. And then yeah. boom, it hits them like a train wreck when the economy basically is in shambles. So don't worry about things until things happen. No, that's not how you protect and hedge and adapt or, and try to get adaptable to whatever comes. It's not how you play it. That's how you cause yourself problems. No, yeah. live, just live in the moment. Forget about the rest. I mean, just, sure. Live in a moment to an extent be balanced with what's coming your way. Try to see those problems or else you will be blindsided and it will hurt. Don't, don't be a privileged per don't act like a privileged person, basically. <laughs> Interesting viewpoint. But anyway, uh... <laughs> you know, how they say privilege because oftentimes they say like the West, you know, those three cycles, the last generation is the most privileged. So it kind of <laughs> foregoes all the chaos and, you know, being productive and caring about things. So you kind of in this little, privileged little excluded bubble from the rest of the world until the rest of the world cat comes and breaks your bubble 
I saw like, I saw this TikTok video of this uh, this girl who just completed two university or college degrees in the states, and she was complaining about not. She's like, I'm overqualified to be doing a customer service job, and I'm like, well, there you go. That's that's the ego that is built up because there's this level of entitlement that's come into the the work the, the work the, the workforce. So. Um, again, funny little video, but guys, it's funny. Really... People would rather be, people would rather be on unemployment than just go work an actual job and just take care of themselves. You know, that's how insane we've gotten. Well, it's the welfare state, right? You just create a dependence on government and then government is coming to save you. And then boom, no, Shrew. next thing you know, you're off to the gulag. I'm joking, obviously, but <laughs> Uh, but yeah, guys, thanks so much for listening uh, to this sort of emergency podcast because um, a lot of stuff's happening too. I'd say right now, Nick, it's probably like a cold World War Three, like a Cold War type of vibe because there's a lot of tensions. Right. But you know, just just keep this in the back of your mind going forward, and um, you know, subscribe to our newsletter. It's called the Macro Chronicles. Uh, New Gen Mindset. Go straight there. Yeah, just straight there. Type in New Gen Mindset. You'll see it. Um, we talk about what's happening in the world. Um, we talk about bringing on important people who have invested in some of the spaces that we're hedging in. And then in that newsletter, we talk about what we're buying and what we're adding to our portfolio. So we really appreciate your support. And um, yeah, just again, if you're not worried about what's happening, you should be worried. So we'll leave it at that. And we'll see you next time, guys, on the New Gen Mindset Podcast. Ciao, guys. Take care.